All right. So as uh, Sherry said, uh, my name is Ashley Bodkins, uh, and I, we are with the University of Maryland Extension. Uh, and uh, this presentation is adapted from a presentation called Starting a Successful Vegetable Garden by John Tronfeld. He is the director for the Home and Garden Information Center with uh, University of Maryland. Uh, so we are taking some of his information and expanding on it today. So our goal is to keep this presentation about 45 minutes. If you guys have questions, please feel free to uh, enter them in the chat box and we'll either Whichever one of us is not presenting, uh, we will answer the chat. And um, if we miss something, we'll try to come back to it at the end of the presentation. So uh, we are with the University of Maryland Extension, which is part of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Uh, so this is a flow chart that shows you a little bit about uh, how this all uh, flows together within the university system. And both Sherry and I are master gardener coordinators. Uh, I'm the coordinator here in Garrett County in Western Maryland. Uh, and she is the Master Gardener Coordinator in Allegheny County, so just a little bit uh, to our east. So if you guys have questions about the Master Gardener program, uh, please feel free to enter them in the chat. I know some folks on the call are Master Gardeners and we appreciate that support um, and they going out into the communities and helping us to spread gardening knowledge. So a quick question, why do people want to grow vegetables? Uh, you probably already have your own reasons for joining this. Uh, if you're joining this presentation today, but just a few reasons that we thought of off the top of our head was uh, with COVID-19 uh, and those restrictions that everyone, uh, you know, we had to adhere to. Um, it's a great way to make sure that you have some fresh vegetables in your own backyard. Uh, so we had a lot of, you know, a lot of people had difficulty getting to grocery stores and, you know, it just wasn't nearly as easy to go out and get what we needed during a lot of the really strict restrictions. Um, a few months ago. So other reasons include flavor and freshness and you can guarantee that your vegetables are going to be pesticide free or whatever you choose to put on them you'll know exactly uh, what's going to be on there so you can provide a safe and healthy uh, food source for your family and yourself. Uh, so there's lots of other benefits that are associated with gardening uh, that range anywhere from mental health to physical health um, just you know getting out in the sunshine and getting some extra vitamin D. Uh, so there's a great there's a whole, whole slew of reasons why you may want to start your own vegetable garden. Um, and one of my favorites is, of course, you know, sharing uh, the passion for vegetable gardening with the next generation. Uh, so that's always something fun that you can pass on to, to friends and younger family members. So we are going to be teaching a common sense ecological approach. Uh, so we always want to encourage folks to, um, you know, get anything that's local as much as you can. You can cut down on you know, shipping costs and things like that. So, you know, use local materials whenever available and whatever you have may be a little bit different from what your neighbor has or what your cousin in another state has. Uh, so just, you know, be open to being resourceful and using different uh, types of materials depending on what you may have. The other thing we're gonna focus a lot on is feeding the soil. Uh, so my background is in agronomy and study of soil science. So I love to talk about soil. We'll be talking about that in the next couple slides. But um, just remember that the more diversity that you have within your garden system, uh, the better you're, you're going to probably do because you're going to have a whole wide variety of different organisms with soil organisms as well as beneficial insects coming in if you don't just have a monoculture. So you don't just want to plant all sweet corn or all Sweet Williams, uh, you want to have a mixture of a lot of different vegetables and, and beneficial um, other plants to help bring in beneficial insects to help you know, combat some of the problems that we see uh, in a typical vegetable garden setting. So the very first step and the most important thing that you can do uh, to ensure that you're going to have a great successful garden is to have good soil. So whether that is soil that you're going to be purchasing as, as topsoil or amendments, or if you're going to be tr creating a traditional in-ground garden, uh, pick a spot in your yard uh, or in your landscape that has great soil. Um, good deep uh, soil is going to be your best bet with, lots, with not very many rocks. Uh, you want somewhere that's well drained. Uh, and if you don't have really great soil to begin with, we're going to talk about how you can build that soil and make it a little bit better. The number one thing you can do is to add organic matter. Uh, so 
Again, what makes a good soil? You want something that's well drained. You want something that's what we call deep or the word friable. So that means if you, you know, uh, take a scoop of it in your hand and you squish it, um, it's not really going to stay in a ball. It's kind of going to fall apart. You want it to be crumbly. Uh, that's going to ensure that you have a lot of good drainage and a lot of space for those roots to penetrate. All right, the other thing that you can do is uh, you can make sure that you do regular additions of organic matter. Uh, this is going to help improve your soil structure. So we can't change the texture of our soil. So if you have a sandy or a, you know, a sandy soil or a loamy soil or, you know, a clay soil, you can't really change that. Um, but you can improve the structure. Uh, so we can do that with um, by adding organic matter. And we're going to talk about the next slide, shows you some great um, options for organic matter. Uh, you also want to test your soil. Uh, that's one of your greatest uh, benefits is to know exactly what is in your soil or what you're starting with. So testing your soil uh, gives you a good snapshot of one of the most important things is the pH. Uh, you want to aim for somewhere with a pH around 6.5. Uh, 6 to 6.8 is the preferred range, but um, by knowing what your soil pH is, it will tell you what nutrients are going to be available uh, for your plants to take up. And just a, a quick note is that urban and suburban soils, uh, they're often pretty low quality. Uh, so knowing exactly what's there can really help you uh, to know how to, how to fix that soil or how to make it best for your garden. So these are some great ways to add organic matter uh, to your soil. You can use farmyard manure. Uh, that's very common in a lot of rural areas. Uh, we do recommend that you put that on in the fall of the year though. You want to have enough time for all that bacteria uh, to get out there, to get broken down and get out of the soil before you actually plant your vegetables. Compost, and this would be the compost that's already you know, made, not just the raw ingredients that make compost. You can also add things like shredded leaves and grass clippings. Those are great um, nitrogen sources. Uh, and a lot of our plants need a high amount of nitrogen in order to thrive. And while you're building up your organic matter in your soil, you may have to add several inches uh, for the first few years uh, in order to get a great amount readily available to your plants. Uh, but after you get the soil built up to where you think it needs to be, you probably only need to add about one inch uh, every year to help maintain a lot of those high plant yields. So what do your plants really need? Uh, the number one thing you can do is to put your garden in a place that's going to get full sun. So that means six to eight hours of direct sunlight. If you don't have a place that gets that much sunlight, then um, your plants are not going to thrive. So I'm not saying you cannot, um, you cannot grow a garden if you don't have full sun. I'm just saying that your plants are not going to produce nearly as well if you don't have that amount of sunlight. So the more sun, the better, uh, especially in the peak of the growing season. So, you know, April to, to September, that's when you really want to have an area that gets that full sun. You also want to think about the water. Uh, often when we think about raised bed or container gardening, uh, water is going to be our most limiting source. Uh, so then the, um, the thing that limits plant growth the most is going to be the amount of water that you apply. And the last thing you want to do is to make sure that you have some source of nutrients for your plants to keep them healthy and thriving. Uh, the more readily available these nutrients are to your plants, the, the easier they're going to have, the easier time they're going to have growing. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And we're going to go over some great um, additions that you can make with some of these nutrients. Uh, you can also think about adding uh, drip irrigation systems. Uh, this is a great way to save time and money, um, as well as water resources by keep putting the drip irrigation systems uh, directly on the soil. Uh, that makes sure that you're not getting the plants have excess water on their leaves, especially through the evening, which can help encourage a lot of fungal diseases. Uh, so by keeping the, the soil moist and not necessarily the plant leaves, that's a great, a great thing to do in your garden. 
Um, if you don't want to invest in a drip irrigation system, just be sure that when you're either hand watering them that you put the water again as close to the soil surface as you can get. A couple things about fertilizing. Uh, nitrogen is often the most, um, the highest amount of nutrients that's needed by our plants. If you look at a fertilizer bag, if you go to purchase like a chemical fertilizer, um, a lot of times there's going to be three um, nutrients available and they're going to be nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. If there's any other numbers listed on that uh, fertilizer bag, then you, it'll have to tell you exactly what that other nutrient is. Um, so just be forewarned that there are different uh, forms of nitrogen available. There's organic and inorganic forms uh, and your plants need to have an inorganic form in order for them to take it up directly. So uh, like ammonium and nitrate, those are plant available forms. Uh, they're also the most volatile. So uh, just be careful with those. Things like compost and animal manure and organic types of fertilizer or nitrogen sources they are not available to the plant right away. You have to wait for mother nature and microbes to break them down and change it into a form that's gonna be more readily available to your plants. Just a quick note that you can over apply those organic fertilizers and those sources. So be careful, you don't wanna burn your plants. And just a couple tips about uh, preventing weeds from growing. Uh, weeds are the, going to be something that compete for nutrients, sun, water, and space in your garden. So the best, the best plan is to keep those Uh oh, you guys, can you guys hear me now? Yes, yes we yes. can hear you. Okay, so what did you hear last? Um, you just started the weeds slide, just started. Okay, all right, thank you. And I hear some noise in the background, so could everyone please make sure that they are muted? Thank you. Okay. So um, just a note about weeds, you wanna be sure that if you can keep weeds from germinating, uh, that's the best bet. So whether that's through uh, different types of mulches, which we're gonna talk about, or um, you know, doing a lot of hand tilling so that the smaller they are, the easier they are to control. Uh, and anytime your soil is disturbed, so anytime you, you till it or you move it or you walk in it, that gives a, an opportunity for for those weeds uh, seeds to get to the top of the soil surface and sort soil profile. And once they get to the top, that's when they get um, all the sunlight that they need, the, the moisture that they need, as well as um, the water that they need. And that's when they're gonna start to germinate. Uh, so if you can prevent weeds, that's, that's the best way to go. Um, once you get them, again, control them when they're in a small state and that'll save you a lot of, of trouble. Okay, so after you figure out a, you know, a plan um, as far as where you want to put your garden or where, you're, where you get the full sun, where might be the best soil uh, that you have in your landscape, uh, we just wanted to make a note that, you know, think about how much time you want to put into this garden. You always want to start small. Uh, the smaller you start, the more successful you're probably going to be. Uh, a lot of people think that they can go up and, you know, go out and start a huge garden the first year and they're soon overwhelmed. Uh, once you get overwhelmed, it's really hard, um, you know, to, to go back the other way. So start small. Um, how much time do you have to devote to this project? Uh, you think you have a lot of time. Um, you may be surprised at how long it actually takes you to uh, garden. And a lot of the, the fun parts of gardening is, is the planning or the, the planting. So that takes very little time as compared to, you know, um, how it takes very little time compared to how much maintenance work you have to do. So how much time you have to water each day. 
how much time you have to consider actually, um, you know, harvesting and, and taking care of the weeds and pulling weeds and things like that. So always start small. And the last part that I'm going to talk about is just to observe and take notes. Um, you know, be sure that anything that you have success with, you want to note that. Um, we tend to only remember the, the highlights of it at the end of the gardening season. So uh, just remember that uh, there's going to be a lot of trials and tribulations along the way. So take good notes and that'll be helpful as you begin to plan your next season's garden. All right, Sherry, I think we're going to transition and let Sherry talk a little bit from here on out. Okay, hey, thanks, Ashley. Um, can you give me control there? You are controlling. Okay, let's see if I can go forward. I can. Great. Okay, just want to make sure. And yeah, put me up one back one more back onto the the succession gardening. Let's see if I can okay. back. Have you started here at what type of vegetable garden? Oh, did you already do the um Okay, very good. We'll start there. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Sorry for the little bit of confusion there. So we're going to talk about the different kinds of vegetable gardens that you can have uh, where you live. And uh, there's, you know, in ground, there are container gardens and raised beds. There's all kinds of ways that you can find to grow vegetables. Where I always say where there's a will, there's a way. So we are going to, let's see. There we go. Now we're going to talk about um, how to do an in-ground garden, which is the, the most common thing that folks do is, oh my, why is it all the way? Let's see if we can get back to the other picture. Well, we'll just stay here. Okay, so the most common thing that folks do uh, is, or the most traditional way of gardening is when you uh, start an in-ground garden. And that all depends on the amount of space that you have. Uh, if you are living in an apartment or a townhouse, you may not be able to do an in-ground garden, but uh, some, some folks have some space and they can do that. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to kill the sod. And there are many ways of doing that. And uh, one way is to actually turn the soil over using a spade. And that when you do that, all you know, the organic matter is in the top few inches of the soil. So you don't necessarily want to take that scoop of soil and turn it upside down in your hole. And then you're putting all of that organic matter down at the bottom of the hole and having the subsoil near the top. So if you're going to do that, uh, we suggest that you when you take your chunk of soil to turn it over, turn it on its side so that the organic matter and the grass part is not at the very bottom of your hole. And chop up that, that soil that you um, just turned over. And also you're gonna need to make sure you take out uh, roots of perennial weeds like dandelions or uh, buttercup or whatever kind of weeds you might have in your yard because those roots will continue to grow um, if you pull it out, if you don't pull it out. But side really does, um, it's really pretty easy to kill the side. So when you're chopping it up, just make sure that any little pieces of side that are left over are turned upside down and you pull out those perennial uh, weeds. Now, the other thing that um, we talk to people about is uh, double digging and you wonder what in the world is that? So that's another way to do an in-ground garden is where you would actually take the sod off first. You slice off the sod, you pile it on the side, turn it upside down so that the sod is going to die. It might take um, a few weeks. You could cover it to kind of hasten things along with a tarp or something. And then you take your scoop of soil out and you set it to the side. Once you got your bed dug out, then you take the garden fork 
there with the four tongs and you can step on that into, and you push it down into the bottom of your hole and you wiggle it back and forth. And this is to loosen the subsoil. It also helps to put channels in there where air and water can get to your plant roots. And then after you've uh, loosened up that subsoil, then you're gonna scoop your uh, soil that you just pulled out of that hole back into the hole, chop it up, try and keep your topsoil near, near the top. And, um, and then you can also add some organic matter to the top of that after you've done that. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is an easier way to uh, start a vegetable garden. And this has become my favorite way of doing it in the last few years. Uh, this does not require uh, digging and disturbing the soil. And there are a lot of good reasons for that. Um, one being that as soon as you disturb soil, you expose weed seeds and you're gonna get weeds growing and it, it encourages weeds to grow. And it also, um, it continued digging can uh, mess with the soil structure and make it not as healthy. Turning soil over also ex exposes organic matter, which when uh, it hits the air, uh, it, it uh, gets burned up and used up. So this is a great way, low, low work, uh, not as hard to work to start a vegetable garden, you can pick your spot and then you're gonna cover that area with cardboard. And then on top of the cardboard, you can add soil and your yard waste like chopped up leaves from the fall. Uh, if you have grass clippings from when you're mowing, you're gonna collect that in the bag and any kind of um, trimmings from your yard. You don't wanna put sticks in there. Um, and you don't also don't wanna put diseased plant material. You can put um, compost and uh, composted manure. The best time to do this is in the fall, okay? Cause that's when you're gonna have access to all this yard waste, uh, the chopped up leaves and grass and uh, dead spent plants. And, and then it's gonna have time over you know, the fall and into the spring to decompose. And then, you'll have this nice mixture of uh, organic material that you can plant directly into in the spring. Now, if you're like me and you don't necessarily plan ahead and you want to start a garden now and you haven't done this in the fall, all is not lost, okay? You can still, you can still garden, you can still create a garden this way. You, um, you would put down your cardboard, but you're probably gonna to need to make sure that you have at least um, six inches of um, organic material on top of that that's ready to go, ready to be planted in. So you could use well uh, rotted manure uh, from cows or horses or rabbits or chickens or whatever the livestock is. And, or you could use something like leaf grow, which is a composted leaf uh, product that is sold here in Maryland. You also might have your own compost, finished compost from a pile that you started yourself. So, if you do that, you can start planning um, immediately. And the cardboard does take about a couple months to break down, but that depends on how wet it is and what your climate is like. But uh, if, you, if you wanted to, you could actually do a thick sheet of uh, newspaper instead of cardboard. The newspaper would break down sooner and plant roots would be able to get through it faster if, um, you didn't necessarily think you could get six inches or more of organic material on top of that, that cardboard. Okay, so perhaps you don't have a space to do an in-garden, in-ground garden. You can always do containers. Um, if you live mm -hmm. in an apartment and you don't have a patio area, like you're on the second floor or higher and you have a porch kind of, but it's got um, a wall, you could think about using deck planters that just uh, mount right onto the edge of, the, of your railing and you could grow um, smaller type vegetables like herbs and lettuces and radishes. You could do baby greens for, you could do uh, beets or spinach or um, arugula, all kinds of good things um, in those, in those uh, deck um, containers. And uh, 
If you have more space than that, you can use larger containers to grow bigger things. And you need to match the container to the size of the plant that you want to grow so that it's uh, healthy and has enough nutrients. So for instance, a tomato would need something like a five gallon bucket, okay? Um, let's see, a pepper would need like a three gallon bucket. And you also wanna make sure that you have drainage holes in the bottom of it. Um, the material, of, it doesn't have to be a fancy pot, okay? It could be just a, a plastic bucket, but it should be food grade. You don't wanna use a container that has had some kind of uh, chemicals in it previously, okay? Cause you don't want um, to be exposed to that. You know, you wanna reduce your, your risk. Okay, let's go to the next one. So here's an example of, um, well, we seem to have lost the, the slide, but uh, an example of some other containers that you could use. You have a, a whiskey barrel uh, that you can easily fit uh, a nice tomato plant in. You could do a couple of uh, peppers perhaps, grow carrots in it, beans. Looks like they got an eggplant in that one. Uh, and this other box on the right-hand side, the white one, it's eight cubic feet of growing media and they actually have fit three tomatoes in there. Next slide. Okay, another example of, uh, of growing your vegetables and herbs and, in a pot, and, and you can do flowers. You don't just have to do vegetables in a pot, you could mix flowers uh, in with your vegetables. But this is just beautiful, isn't it? Uh, what they've got grown in there is it looks like they got some uh, kale and per perhaps some uh, or ornamental cabbage, I'm not real sure, and then there's beautiful peppers. And all of that is edible and it, it's beautiful. So you can mix your herbs and vegetables and fruits in with your landscaping around your house. Um, just be careful if if you treat your house for termites and you're putting um, some kind of insecticide into the soil, you probably don't want to plant your, your vegetables, your food plants there. So just a, a word of caution. I'm not really sure how deep that pot is. I saw a question there. Um, that is a, a good point. So you have to consider the plant that you are going to put into the container, what kind of root system it has. Things that are have shallower root systems that you can grow in smaller pots would be lettuces, radishes, turnips. You can start to grow, like I mentioned, the microgreens of, of your other greens like spinach and, um, and kale and beets, but they might need a little more soil if you wanna grow them at, definitely need some more soil if you wanna grow them to maturity. Um, this plant this potter here with the pot here with the peppers in it probably is fairly deep. I would say that's probably at least a three gallon pot there. So, okay. And we will go to the next one. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about raised beds and the raised beds uh, that has some advantages and some disadvantages. So some of the advantages are that they, because they're above ground, they do tend to warm up more quickly. They drain better than uh, in-ground soil. And when you build the raised beds, you are putting in some really great organic material and healthy um, garden soil, and you're able to add all kinds of uh, great amendments to it to make it a nice friable soil. So plants tend to be very happy in raised beds and, and, and grow well. It increases the available rooting area for your plants because the soil is not compacted, it's not overworked. So you can potentially get uh, greater food production in the same square uh, footage from a raised bed. But some disadvantages are that there are upfront costs because you have to go and buy the materials and it takes time. Uh, to build these things and you need to have skills or know somebody with skills who can build and has tools. Um, they're really not that hard to build, but you do need to have the tools. And um, on average, like a four by eight 
box that's 10 inches high is going to cost you about $100 in materials. Okay. Okay, so some raised bed basics. Generally, when you build your, your raised beds, you don't want them to be wider than four feet because you don't want to have to, to step into them to be able to work in your garden. So generally, people can reach into the center of a four-foot box, okay? And the length is, is up to you. It depends on the lumber that you buy. I mean, some lumber comes in uh, eight foot, could be six foot, 10, 12, whatever. Um, the length doesn't matter so much, but uh, how wide it is does, because you don't want to have to step into it. And, you know, once you get it built and you fill it with your, um, your soil and compost mix, you know, you've got an instant garden ready to go. All right, trying to get it forward here. All right, so there are five to 10 plant families that are represented in the average vegetable garden that most people are you know, planting. But did you know this, that there really aren't too many vegetable plants that are native to North America? Can you think of one? Uh, Jerusalem artichoke <laughs> might be one. We have a lot more native fruits, but not a whole lot of uh, native, native vegetables. Most of our vegetable plants that we use have come from, from Europe or, or in Asia now. Um, but uh, you do need good growing conditions in order to produce high yields. And those good growing conditions include having, you know, at least six to eight hours of sunlight. And Ashley already talked about that. Okay, and you can also incorporate your vegetables into your ornamental landscapes. You can think outside the box. You don't have to have just, you know, one designated area for vegetables and that's it. Okay. So um, seven crops for starters. Uh, we're going to talk about those. They're easy to grow, and most people like these. But of course, you know, only grow what you like to eat. But one thing that people uh, often grow is tomatoes. Is I just think there's nothing like having uh, a homegrown tomato that is allowed to get ripe on the vine, and you're able to to pick it at the peak of flavor. Um, and bring it in and eat it. There's just nothing that beats that. And there are so many different tomato varieties out there. Now, tomatoes uh, do, they are a warm season plant. So they do require uh, a longer growing time. And depending on what your goal is, um, you may want to start things from seed indoors, or you can buy um, plants from the nursery so that you don't have to go through all of that of uh, starting the seeds indoor, keeping the plants healthy for a while and having good light and all that stuff, which is subject for another webinar. Okay, and next are peppers. And peppers are also a warm season um, vegetable and they do require warm nights, warm temperatures, warm soil, just like tomatoes and they do take a while to mature. So um, I, I generally buy my plants from a local nursery, unless there's a special variety that I want that you can't find at a nursery. I like some hot peppers. I, I tried an heirloom variety of hot peppers called uh, fish pepper, and that's not something that you could find at the local nursery. So some, sometimes when there are special varieties that you wanna grow, you're gonna to have to seek out the seeds and start them yourself indoors. But um, there's nothing like uh, a fresh pepper off the, off the shrub there. <laughs> so I think with that, it is time for Ashley to take over. All right, thanks, Sherry. So we're gonna pick right up with cucumbers. Uh, so one of the, the, the tricks for growing cucumbers is to save some space and make them climb. Uh, they will put out these little um, tendrils that will wrap around any type of structure that you give them to climb up. So cucumbers like to grow, they like to go up, they'll follow wherever, wherever you want them to go um, if you make them a trellis. So that's a great way to do it. 
Uh, some problems that I see a lot with cucumbers are cucumber beetles. Uh, so as Sherry said, that's a pest management is a topic for another day. Um, but just be forewarned, uh, hand picking the type of little creepy crawly insects that are bad um, is a great way to, to get them out of your garden and not use any, any type of insecticide or, or pesticide. Uh, so lots of different varieties. If you have a small space for cucumbers, look for patio varieties or you know um, something like that. You can even put them in hanging baskets, but um, just be forewarned that you're not gonna get a lot of production out of a hanging basket just because uh, the soil um, space is not there for the plant to produce, but you will get a couple. Uh, next we have on our uh, seven vegetables to start with our summer squash. Uh, we love summer squash, things like zucchini and yellow zucchini. Uh, just, just know that one plant will produce a lot of squash, so uh, don't go too crazy uh, with planting too many or you will be feeding everyone that you know. Uh, a joke I heard once is that you don't have to lock your car anytime in the country except during squash season because people will just uh, stick squash in your car because they have so, so many of them to, uh, to give away. Uh, but a really easy crop to to start with, I would be forewarned about squash bugs. Um, they do love your squash, so uh, just be mindful that they look kind of like a stink bug, but they're brown. And if you look on the underneath side of your leaves, that's where you're going to see the first evidence. A lot of these insects um, coming about, you'll see their eggs. And with squash bugs, they are bright red, so you can't really mistake them for a, a good bug. Um, I see a question in the chat about, can we recommend any flowers? And while I'm talking, I can recommend um, nasturtium. Uh, so nasturtiums are a great uh, companion plant for a lot of these, either squash and cucumbers. It's, they think that it helps with deterring uh, cucumber beetles and also squash bugs. Uh, the next plant we have is bush beans. Um, I absolutely love beans. They are one of the easiest plants to grow and they produce for a long time. So they're a great beginner crop. Lots of different varieties. You can do pole beans. Um, if you have the space to, you know, trellis them up, uh, you can just do a regular, you know, uh, bush bean. And just remember that you'll get several harvests off of one single plant. Um, so you just won't pick them once. You can pick them multiple times. Uh, but if you want to plant them more than once, uh, you can ensure that you have a longer season to harvest those bush beans. So uh, they're a really easy plant. I like um, jade is a commercial uh, variety that I grow. Uh, we also like um, Blue Lake, um, and if you like some of the older varieties, things like Half Runners, but they have strings. Uh, so those are some good ones to, to start with that I like. And then, of course, we have lettuce. Uh, you know, lettuce is one of the number one bought vegetables each week by every household because it's so versatile and can be used in a lot of different ways um, in your diet. Uh, it's really easy to grow. It tends to like cooler temperatures, so you want to plant it early in the season and then again late in the season so that it doesn't get bitter and it doesn't bolt. Uh, so just remember your lettuces, uh, things like leaf lettuce is one of the easiest things to grow, especially for kids. Uh, and if you have trouble getting it to germinate, don't cover it. Um, sometimes some varieties tend to germinate better with open light, uh, so don't put any soil on top of it and you'll usually increase your germination rates. Uh, the next vegetable, I think this is our last one in our seven, uh, are any type of leafy greens like kales and mustards and, and um, Swiss chard and things like that. Uh, a lot of these, again, they tend to do better in cooler weather, so your shoulder season, so early in the spring uh, and late in the fall. Uh, they don't normally do too great uh, during the hot season uh, with the exception of Swiss chard. So we just wanted to put a little bit more information in here about uh, some raised beds. So what can you put in a raised bed? A lot of times folks will, we recommend doing no wider than four feet. If you can get to either side of your raised bed, don't go wider than that because that's what most people can reach across. Um, if you can reach mm -hmm. only one side, then we recommend you stick with just a three foot wide uh, raised bed. Uh, so this is just a sample if you have an eight by eight foot area. Uh, for your garden, what you could grow. Uh, and this would just be one uh, part of the season. So this would be usually during the warm, the warmest part of your growing season. So for us, this would be June until our first frost in early uh, September here in Western Garrett County in Western Maryland. Uh, so uh, 
uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, you know succession planting in the coming in the coming slides and how you can you know, when one plant gets done, how you can put another plant in that same location, that's called succession planting. And we'll have some other ideas on how you can utilize that space a little bit better. So the big question is, can I really save money with, with growing my own vegetables? Uh, and, uh, you know, it goes back and forth. I, I definitely think you can if you are resourceful. Uh, definitely, if you are don't have a lot of money to invest in a garden, I recommend an in-ground garden for the first year if you have a place that has a lot of sun. Um, that way, the only thing you really have to invest is um, some hard labor. Uh, and if you can have some help with that, then you know an in-ground garden is pretty easy to start. Uh, so we just have a tale of the $100 tomato. So if you buy every single thing that you see to grow a tomato, it can get a little bit overwhelming and you definitely can invest a lot of money really quickly. Uh, so just be mindful that, you know, if you can go to the local greenhouse or the local farmer's market and buy, you know, a bushel of tomatoes for $38, you don't want to, you don't want to be um, spending way more than what you could, you could buy them locally. Um, so just think about that. Be resourceful. Think about what you already have access to in your landscape or, or you know, anything you can scavenge from neighbors or friends and family uh, when you are starting a garden. And just, you know, on average, if, if we go back to this slide with this sample eight by eight foot um, space where we have two eight foot by three foot raised beds, that should produce, you know, around $200 to $250 of fresh produce within the growing season. So if that raised bed, if you're going to go that route, you know, the, the lumber, you know, it could last, you know, for multiple years, depending on what source you do use. If it's a hardwood or a cedar lumber, it could last up to 15 years. So that's a, it is some money to invest up front, but it should last for several years. And then just a little bit more about picking a site. Uh, so again, you want level ground and something that's close to water. I always tell folks that are starting a garden that if you have to go to the back 40 to water your garden every night, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, versus if you can turn on a spigot and run a water hose, um, you know, to your garden, it's more likely that you're going to do it even on days that you're tired, even on days that it's hot. Uh, so Anytime you can pick a site that's that's close to a water source, um, do that. And the level where the ground is, the less likely you're going to have soil running off. Um, you know, it's going to be a little easier for you to stand in. It's going to be easier for you to to plant uh, and things like that. Uh, southern exposure is going to get the most the most heat and the, the warmest the, uh, amount of sun throughout the growing season. Always put your tallest plants on the north side so that uh, you're not going to block your plants from sun, uh, any, but you could put things that like shade, you know, behind those tall growing plants. So on this, like in this example, you have the, the tomato stakes on the furthest side. So on the other side of that, you could plant something like lettuce that's gonna get a little less um, sun that way and it'll thrive a little bit more in that shaded area. And then of course, things like protecting from critters is really important. Um, you know, deer will munch on pretty much anything at least once. And depending on what, you know, how much pressure you have from things like deer, uh, they can wipe out a garden in no time flat. Also for anybody that maybe has like backyard chickens, um, they love to scratch in a garden and they can do a lot of damage to your tomatoes and your plants that are coming on. So, uh, you know, there are some really good uh, cheap, um, deer fence options. I saw some just recently that was seven feet tall, like a, a plastic mesh uh, deer fence uh, that was just $20 so for a hundred feet of seven foot tall deer fence. So, you know, if you, you don't, you may not realize that you have a critter problem until it's too late. Uh, so just be mindful if you plan it, then they will come. Uh, so just be careful with that. And, you know, one of the easiest pieces of information that you have in your arsenal is you have your seed packets if you're going to grow your own seeds uh, and all the information that you need can be found on the back of most uh, seed packets. Uh, so use that information to help you. It tells you, you know, how many weeks until you, how many weeks it's going to take to germinate or how many days to germinate and then how many weeks until you're going to be able to transplant it outside. So I always tell folks to get a calendar 
figure out what day you want to plant. For us, our frost-free uh, date here in Western Maryland is uh, June the 5th. So we can't plant any frost-sensitive crops before that. Uh, usually Memorial Day weekend is when we recommend that. So, um, you know, get a calendar and work your way back to spending on what you want to grow. Uh, so, for example, this is eggplant. They take at least an eight to ten weeks to uh, grow inside in a heated area before you're going to be able to, to plant them outside. Uh, so for us, you know, we're going to be starting these sometime in, in mid-March. And then growth, growing healthy transplants. Um, Roberta dropped a link to our Western Maryland, uh, University of Maryland uh, YouTube channel earlier in the chat. We can drop it in again. We have some good videos. Sherry did a great video on starting seeds. Uh, if you start with healthy transplants, you can definitely uh, shave off some time in your growing season, which can help whenever you're trying to get multiple plantings, multiple successions in, in your same spot. Uh, so the, the bigger and healthier your, your plants are when you put them out, uh, the, the better off you'll be and the sooner you'll be able to harvest uh, some vegetables for all your hard work. So how can we do intensive gardening um, and why would we want to? Uh, the main advantage is that you're gonna get a lot more produce and a lot more vegetables or fruit to eat uh, per square foot. Uh, the disadvantage is that if you put too much in an area um, and crowd them too much, uh, you're not gonna get anything. Uh, so trying to really figure out the best spacing, again, go back to that seed packet. Um, if you wanna do things like um, companion planting, um, that's also a great way, you know, planting plants that help each other and either, you know, prevent bugs from coming or else put things like nitrogen into the soil. So things like the three sisters garden where you plant corn, um, a pole bean, and then either a squash or a pumpkin all together in the same area. And the corn acts as a post for the pole bean. The pole bean, of course, is a legume. So it helps to fix nitrogen, which the corn and squash need. And then the squash or pumpkin helps to provide shade uh, and helps prevent needing extra water for the system. Uh, so that's an example of, um, you know, companion planting. And succession planting is another word for that is relay planting, where as soon as one plant is done, uh, you would put in another plant. Uh, so I think we have some examples of that coming up. So here's some examples of, you know, what's too close or what's too far apart. On the right hand side, the okra plants are definitely too close together. So you need to go in and, and space those out. Uh, you know, for okra, you probably need at least eight inches in between plants. Uh, here's an example of onions. So when those onion sets were planted, you know, this foot spacing looks like that's way too far apart when they're small, but whenever they get bigger, then that's that's the perfect size. Uh, some here's some examples of interplanting where you would mix in, you know, a cold crop, something this is probably looks like cauliflower or broccoli uh, with some lettuces. Uh, so they're going to be harvested at different times. Your lettuce is ready to be harvested here almost in this picture. And then your your broccoli hasn't even started to head up. Um, and then here's some examples of like edibles, like purslane that's growing um, in the mix as well. Uh, here's some pictures of um, growing, you know, mustard greens on one side and then your tomatoes in the middle, again, utilizing that space. Another good plant uh, to use with your tomatoes would be uh, basil. Basil grows great with tomatoes as well as um, a lot of other herbs. So consider using that space, you know, as wisely as you can. Uh, you can also do lettuce and things like that on one side, again, because it's going to be harvested before the tomatoes actually come on and start to uh, be, har be ready and take up a lot of the space. Okay. One more slide about, um, you know, your succession. It does require uh, some planning. So uh, the first couple years, it may take a little while to get to get a, get in the habit of doing it. And you are going to, you know, use the nutrients in your plants in your soil a little bit quicker because you are planting multiple plants in that same area. So be careful um, not to mine your soil. Make sure that you are going to replenish it with either compost halfway through the growing season 
or some fertilizer additions. And Sherry, I think we were going to transition here. Um, hey. Does this, you, you ready? Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to see if I can't get these slides to forward here. All right. So we were just talking about succession planting, and it does take a bit of planning. So you have to, first of all, know the difference between cool season vegetables and warm season vegetables. So you're gonna be planting your cool season vegetables in the spring and in the fall, and your warm season vegetables will be growing in the summer. So what you wanna do is you want to plant one kind of, uh, your cool season vegetable in the spring, wait till it finishes growing and you harvest it, and then you can plant your warm season vegetable, wait till that's finished growing and you harvest it, and then in the fall, you can plant your last uh, cool season vegetable. So that's the idea behind succession planting. You're planting in the same garden space, okay? But you're changing the plants out uh, according to uh, their growing habits, okay? So here are some examples of what you could do in the same, uh, say, same garden raised bed, say. So you could plant some garlic in November, harvest it in the spring. After you've harvested, then plant cucumbers. Um, you have to wait till after your last frost, but you could plant your cucumbers, say July 1st, uh, May 31st, whatever. Uh, cucumbers usually take a couple of months uh, before you can harvest. And then once they were done producing, you could then plant some kind of a cover crop in that space that would help to uh, protect the soil and take up nutrients, which can then be um, turned back into the soil in the spring, okay? Another example would be to plant peas in that space. And once the peas have um, produced their pods and you pick them, you can pull those plants out. And then uh, in June, you would plant some squash in that space. That would also take a couple of months. You would harvest, pull those plants out. And then September 1st, you could plant kale in that same space. So I think you, you get the idea here with that, and, and but it does require planning and you will need to do some research on the vegetables that you wanna grow about how long it takes from germination to the time that you can harvest. Or if you're using plug plants, uh, how long be, by, you know, from the time that you plant them till, till harvest. And, and you're gonna to have to you know, figure out when you can um, either pull them or, or harvest them. Okay, so. Next slide is weed management. And Ashley already touched on this a little bit, but, and I mentioned, once you disturb the soil, you're gonna get more uh, weed seed germination. So the, the less you disturb the soil, the better, okay? And one thing to really help with keeping weeds down is mulch, okay? But there are some other methods uh, using cover crops, and you could do that. Usually, people do it in the the early fall and let those cover crops grow until winter, and they may uh, winter kill or they may make it through the winter, depending on what you plant. And in the spring, um, if it's a winter killed uh, cover crop, you could then just plant directly into the soil. Okay, you don't even have to turn the soil over, but if it's not a winter killed uh, cover crop, then you will, you're gonna have to smother that somehow. And it returns the nutrients to the soil. Or you can do the very intensive hand pulling. You can also use a sharp hoe to hoe in between rows, but you're gonna have to do that frequently because every time you disturb the soil, you know, you're gonna get seed germination. Um, and then mulch. So you can try and use some other less common methods uh, using um, a high strength vinegar, a flame weeder, a commercial herbicidal soap. And, you know, I like flamethrowers just as much as the next person, but I don't know. I don't think that the flame weeders are really that effective in a vegetable garden. Maybe you could use that in, on your patio or a driveway or a sidewalk, but I think, I don't know how well you can, come, can control that, keep from um, harming your other plants. But these things, vinegar, flame weeding, 
herbicidal soaps, they are only going to kill the top part of the plant, not the roots. So you're going to get weeds, you know, they're going to keep coming back if they're perennial weeds. Okay. Um, so, and the reason why we need to control weeds is because they do compete with the plants that we want uh, for nutrients and sunlight and water. And if you don't control those weeds, your harvest is not going to be as good because their plants won't be able to grow as well. Okay. Okay, so what are some examples of organic mulches? Um, organic mulches would be uh, straw, it could be chopped up leaves, it could be compost from your garden, it could be shredded newspaper. Um, newspaper is generally printed with a soy ink, so that won't harm you. Uh, you probably don't want to use the glossy papers or colored ink. Let's see, what else can you do? Um, you can use plastic mulches and those are, uh, oh, shredded hardwood mulch. I like those because they, they break down eventually and help to put nutrients back in the soil. You could just lay newspaper between your rows of vegetables and it takes about six weeks for newspaper to break down. So that's another option. Okay, so on this slide, we have examples of plastic mulches and, and they come in different colors and some re research has shown that different colors can uh, provide different benefits depending on the, the crop that you're planting. Some re research has shown that red mulch actually helps tomatoes to produce better. Some um, research has shown that silver mulch or white more, probably more like silver mulch. So silver mulch can actually confuse aphids um, because they're not sure where the sky is. And so that can help aph keep aphids off of your plants. And the thing with these uh, thin plastic mulches is that they only last a season or two and then you have to rip them up and take them to the landfill. So there are some negatives with the plastic mulches is you know the cost of replacing it frequently and also filling up landfills. Um, another option would be landscape fabric. And there are some really heavy duty landscape fabrics, especially if that you can use that are especially good if you have some kind of a, um, a fruit shrub planting because they are going to last for years. And what you do is you take a, a torch and you melt a hole in the in that that landscaping fabric to then plant your, your fruit shrubs in there. Um, so if you have a, a, a long-term planting that you wanna do that you don't expect to be having to uh, disturb very much, you might wanna consider that landscape fabric. Okay, so um, another way to get the most out of your space besides uh, succession planting is to use a vertical space, is to allow the plants to grow up instead of out and covering up the, the soil area. So it's going to give you more yield, yield per square foot, and it also will help keep your, your fruit off of the, the soil and help prevent uh, problems with disease. So some things that you can grow vertically would be cucumbers and squash and pole beans, peas. So you can take advantage of the fence that's around your garden and plant those things right next to the fence. And then they will climb up the fence and not take away from space inside of the garden. All right, let's see if we can go to the next, next one. Oops, wrong way. Okay. Not letting me forward. Okay. Now, Ashley already mentioned this about fencing out the, the critter. So there you saw um, a nice picture, a nice looking fence, okay, that to help keep the, the critters out. And 
that can be kind of expensive. So it depends on how much money you have to work with, you know, or what are some ways of keeping the critters out? You can go, you know, you can spend as much money as you want. You could have a really beautiful fence. You could put up an eight foot, you know, permanent fence to keep out deer. Um, another option with deer is to do a double fence, which would be, you could put in your, your metal poles and you would buy your welded wire fence uh, five foot high fence and put that around and then do another fence around that fence. So you have about four feet, four to five feet in between those two fences. Now they're only about four and a half or five, they're only five feet tall, but because it messes with the deer's depth perception, they won't jump the fence. So that's an option. And I mean, you're just going to have to expect that you are going to have some issues either with groundhogs or rabbits or deer or chipmunks. Okay, so fence is a really important aspect to consider for your garden. And uh, one other note on deer, if, if it's just a, a raised bed that's only about four feet wide, and you, you could put up a simpler fence, they're not going to jump inside of a, um, a four foot wide space. So um, that, that can help you some as far as cost. Also, something that's really simple to keep the critters off of your, your produce is to cover your plants with row cover. And this is only becomes an issue uh, when the plants are uh, flowering. And if they need cross-pollination, you're gonna have to remove that. So you could use a bird netting instead uh, that would allow for uh, pollination to take place. But uh, a row cover is a great way to keep off the critters, especially on your greens, you know, plants that do not require uh, pollination or that are self-pollinated. So keep that in mind too. Okay. Now this is one kind of container that we didn't mention earlier. It is called a, an earth box and it is a self-watering container. So you can see from the picture there, there's a perforated grate. Underneath that grate is where you're gonna have a reservoir of water. And there is a black tube that goes down to that reservoir. Um, you can see in the, I guess, upper right <laughs> of that container. And you would fill your box with soil. And then when you needed to, you could fill up that reservoir of water using that tube, that black tube. Um, so this is a, a nice option if you are somebody who goes away for the weekend. You know, you could don't have to worry about some buddy to be a plant sitter and come over and water your plants. Uh, if you have these self-watering containers, earth boxes cost about $40. There are other products on the market, um, smaller containers as well. So that's just an option to consider. And then University of Maryland uh, has come up with this salad table. It's just really neat. Um, so this, what's great about this is that it's portable and it's at uh, chest height. So if you have issues with mobility, you might wanna consider uh, building a salad table. And the, we have the instructions for that on our um, Home and Garden Information Center website. And uh, maybe somebody can try and find that for me while I'm talking about it and also for the uh, salad boxes. But the salad table is uh, made out of two by fours and it's covered on the bottom with a screen and also with a hardware cloth. So it keeps the soil from, from going through. And in these boxes, you can plant uh, your lettuces and radishes, uh, microgreens. You can even do some bush beans in there, okay? If you wanted to do something like a, a I don't know, a pepper, uh, spinach, some other plants that require uh, more root depth, uh, you could change the design around and make the, the boards, instead of being two by fours for where you're growing meat is, they would need to be probably 10 inch deep, which means you're gonna have to put in some extra support for the table um, around the legs and also um, in the area uh, where you put the soil and it's not going to be as mobile that's for sure it's going to be pretty darn heavy but you can do it if, if you have mobility issues and you don't want to have to bend over so that's also a, a great option and then we also have 
um, whoops, the salad boxes that are uh, a small portable version, okay, of the salad salad table. They're not very big. I forget what the dimensions are in that. It's like, uh, I don't know, 12 inches by 18 inches or something like that. But we also have the plans for that uh, on the Home and Garden Information Center. And this is just a great little uh, way to grow salad greens for yourself. And you can move it to the shade, you know, when you need to, if the weather's getting hot. And a box like that can provide greens for a family of four for a long time. So when you harvest, you don't pull the whole plant out, you just use scissors and cut the leaves off and then the plants keep putting out more leaves. So that's the way that that works. And so these are just some of our resources. We have the Maryland Master Gardener program. And when we do our follow-up on this, we'll send out the slides in a PDF form. So you'll be able to see those uh, references. So it looks like we're near the end here, Ashley. So um, are there questions that we need to, to answer? I think we got most of the questions answered in the chat. If we miss somebody and you wanna re-enter it, please feel free to do so. Uh, we will drop some additional links here uh, for your information. Uh, and if you do have questions, we appreciate you guys joining us today. Uh, we will be sending the slideshow out uh, in the PDF here in the next couple weeks and also uh, the link to the recording that will be on our YouTube channel. Also, I'd like to just make mention of um, there's a place in Allegheny County called the Her Evergreen Heritage Center, and they actually produce Victory Garden kits. It's 12 vegetable plants, including herbs. And they have gotten a grant from USDA that will allow them to give these kits away for free to families that um, who uh, are eligible for free and reduced lunches. Now, I don't have the specifics on that. You will have to go to their website. So you can Google Evergreen Heritage Center, Allegheny County, Maryland, and then you'll find a phone number and you can give them a call and um, work out those details with them, so. We had somebody that wanted to see the resources again, so I stuck those back up. Um, Great. So yeah, if you guys have questions, um, I will put our email addresses in here. If you guys wanna drop, either share your eye and email with questions. Um, you can do that. Uh, well, you can also follow us on Facebook. Uh, we did stream this live uh, and I will drop the link to our upcoming classes. If you want to download the flyer, you can go to this uh, site to, to get those classes. We had one question that says, do you recommend preen? Um, I mean, we, we can't recommend one uh, brand over another, but as far as uh, suppressing germination of weed seeds. I have used it and it has worked pretty well. I mean, it's not foolproof, but yeah, I'd say it, it definitely helped, so. Yeah, and with preen, a lot of times, once you disturb that soil uh, after you apply it, then all of your benefits are gone. So just, you know, be, be forewarned that, um, you know, if you walk in your garden or something like that, then uh, those benefits are gonna be gone and you're gonna get weed germination again. Okay, I had shared the wrong resource slide, so I'm sorry. There's the right resource. <laughs> All right. See any other questions, Sherry? Um, let's see. Can you post info on the $20 fencing? Um, I've seen that fencing at Tractor Supply. Have you seen it anyplace else? Yeah, at most any big box store. So Walmart, Lowe's, um, you know, Home Depot, any of those, I've seen it on there. So. Um, it's pretty affordable. Even Amazon has it. It's just getting it shipped. That's the problem. And I think it was Nicole had a question about invasive thistles. Now they are really difficult to get a hold of or control, and you're going to have to use some herbicides for that. If um, when you get our email, uh, the follow up, just respond to us with that question, and then we can email you some appropriate uh, methods to control. 
thistles, okay? All right, well, we thank you all for joining us today. We hope you had, uh, um, you learned a few things and uh, you're inspired to get out and start your vegetable garden. And I guess we will hopefully see some of you in the next couple weeks at our next uh, presentation that we have planned for you. Yep, thanks everybody. All right, thanks. Get out there and grow. All right.